welcome to Occupy Brooklyn TV. I'm Atik Zabinski. And I'm Leia Mondragon. Here's an overview of our stories today. As Occupies around the world celebrate their one-year anniversary, we visit Oakland, California and Eugene, Oregon. Activists in New York City face criminal charges for fighting stop and frisk. A new union celebrates another victory. And New York finds a new spot to occupy. We'll look at more actions, raising awareness of the Bradley Manning trial and the expansion of New York University. On October 25th, the Oakland community took to the streets to remember the one-year anniversary of the Oakland police's eviction of the Occupy Oakland tent camp. In the course of the violent early morning raid, Oakland police shot U.S. veteran Scott Olson in the head with a beanbag projectile, fracturing his skull and causing brain injury. At a press conference in the morning, community members spoke out against police brutality and Oakland Police's use of excessive force against peaceful demonstrators over the year. One year ago today, we all came in the face of thousands of these pigs in their riot gear, launching tear gas at us, and we came back again and again. It says something about the nature and the sophistication of their repression. But right now, it is making it so hard for so many of us to come back. So what we'd like today is for us as a community to really reflect on what repression looks like amongst us. Personally, in all of our relationships, right? And hopefully to also begin to collectively, as the anti-repression crew, all of us, to think about what anti-repression could look like. Later in the day, hundreds marched in an event called Take Back the Plaza, Vigil, and Fuck the Police March. The march began and ended at Oscar Grant Plaza, the site of the original Occupy Oakland tent camp. Local banks boarded up their windows in preparation for the kind of vandalistic protests such as took place October 7th in commemoration of the anniversary of the war in Iraq. That march also departed from Oscar Grant Plaza but was not organized by Occupy Oakland. Despite the bankers' fears, no such property destruction took place. Organizers posted on their blog, politicalfailblog.com, that, quote, Occupy Oakland has never planned an event which accepted the use of breaking windows as a tactic, end quote. At the march's end, a dance party and slideshow of the year's activities took place in the park's amphitheater. The event ended peacefully before midnight. Ironically, hours later in San Francisco, Giants fans staged a riot in the wake of the World Series. Warnings of impending riot were clear hours in advance, yet police prepared no arrest vans. Even after rioters set fires in the streets, including torching a public bus and pelted police with glass bottles, police showed great restraint in making arrests, in shocking contrast to the violence they have consistently brought to the nonviolent demonstrations of Occupy. New York City teacher Jamel Mims faces up to a year in prison for nonviolently protesting stop and frisk. In a series of actions starting last year, protesters briefly and symbolically blocked the entrances to police stations. The actions were highly orderly, with police in full control, and no police operations visibly disrupted. Nonetheless, what appears to be vindictiveness, charges against MIMS and three other organizers have been repeatedly stepped up. Even as public awareness and condemnation of stop and frisk have risen dramatically. We spoke with Mims just as he awaited word of the rescheduling of his hearing due to Hurricane Sandy. Um, and this was the third and culminating action of a series of citywide civil disobedience protests that really raised the level of resistance to stop and frisk, you know, around New York. A year ago, you had a situation where very few people knew that stop and frisk went on. Um, and those who knew about it thought that there was nothing that they could do about it or that it was somehow it was only because of them, um, or, or that they, they somehow were individually liable for having been stopped. And, you know, because people were willing to put something on the line to challenge that and actually raise the profile of that and, and resist that, you know, it, it inspired people, it inspired people there in Harlem and Brownsville and in Queens, you know, you know, it inspired people, you know, across, it inspired people across the country to know that there was a core of people who were taking this up and who were actually determined to fight against it and to wage resistance against it. Um, and so again, now taken in this context, we have a year later where you have politicians lining up on the left and right to figure out what to do with this policy while essentially keeping it intact. 
on the 11th hour of the pretrial motions, the prosecutor enters in, you know, not officially, but enters in uh, simply into the way that he, that, that he in, into the charge sheet, um, the phrase acting in concert, uh, which then implied accessorial liability. Um, and this is the thing where, you know, again, they threw that in there because if they, they think that if they can sink one, they can sink everybody. All the time you're hearing this trial coming from the judge that stop and frisk is not on trial. Stop and frisk is not on trial. Well, objectively in society, stop and frisk is on trial. And it's on trial in the popular conscience of people in New York and all across the nation. You know, this is breaking open a discourse on mass incarceration. And, you know, historically situate this, you know, with the equivalence that we look back at the black liberation movement of the 60s. And it has that kind of urgency and moral imperative. You know, we're acting with the same moral imperative of, you know, of abolitionists who were working to stop, you know, who were, who were looking at targeting a specific policy, but looking to stop it, an entire system of racialized oppression. And that's actually, those are actually the terms of this, of, of this trial. And what, you know, what winning or losing this trial means and what it ultimately, ultimately means in society. For updates on the cases against the Stop, Stop and Frisk defendants, visit stopmassincarcerations.org. On October 26th, a new victory was announced in the struggle of the Hot and Crusty Workers Association, a fledgling one-shop union of bakery workers organized with the assistance of Occupy Wall Street's Immigrant Workers Justice Group. Following several weeks of negotiations with the new ownership of the store, workers will return to the job under a new collective bargain agreement that provides for a union hiring hall, paid vacation and sick time, wage increases, seniority, and grievance and arbitration procedures. Under previous management, the largely undocumented workers labored under unsafe conditions for sub-minimum wage and no overtime compensation, some employees working upwards of 70 hours a week. When management chose to close the shop rather than negotiate, the union staged an occupation of their workplace, and when turned out by police, set up a baked goods stand on the sidewalk. Mahoma Lopez, who has worked at Hot and Krusty for over seven years, said, The workers are really excited about this news because this is more than just a contract for us. We are putting an example out there for other workers and other immigrant workers that anything is possible when you organize. We want others to take this victory to their own workplaces so we can make change in this country. A group of occupiers in New York City have found a new place to camp in protest. The sidewalk outside 15 Central Park West, home of Goldman Sachs CEO Lloyd Blankfein. The occupation began shortly after the October 13th Global Noise Action, during which the casserole-style debt protest gave the site a noisy visit. And then people just started thinking, like, why don't we camp out there? Um, you know, kind of make it a little more personal. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, the first night we were like right directly across the street um, from Lloyd Blankfein's house. Um, and then we decided to move into, there's like a little alcove um, that's also right across the street, but it's technically Central Park land. Um, and we were there for a few nights, um, and then they finally came in and they actually made us leave that area. Um, and then we ended up moving our stuff to here because there's more foot traffic here. Like it's crazy how many people walk by right here, um, which was a really good move. I mean, technically we're not as close as we could you know, possibly be, um, but his house is right there. He's up on the 11th floor. I mean, it, it, he has one of these windows. He can see us here. 20, 20, 30 people is usually about what we've got now um, at any given point. Well, I mean, there, there's obviously, you know, two, two sides to it. There's the people that walk by and just yell, get a job or whatever, and come here to harass us, which doesn't happen often. Um, but we are seeing more of the support um, coming in. Occupy Goldman Sachs sign. Um, you know, I mean, there's always quite a few people here. We, we've got uh, information to hand out. Um, so a lot of people, they're just, they walk by and they're like, what, what is this? Um, and I'm sure a lot of the people that do stop by, you know, at least have heard of Goldman Sachs and kind of know what they're about. Um, but hopefully those people will at least start paying more attention. 
um, you know, and maybe before they were thinking like, ah, oh, whatever, you know, um, but now they see people who are camping out here, you know, and sleeping out in the cold and, you know, are here day in and day out, they might like think about looking into it a little bit more. We've gotten a lot of people stopping by um, with like clothing and food and support has been growing a lot uh, since like the first couple nights. And it's just kind of, we're taking it day by day, you know, there's no plan like, oh, we're here for this long. I mean, you know, it's, well, I mean, there's a, there's a hurricane coming. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Um, there is some scaffolding right on the other side of, of 15 CPW, uh, where Lloyd Blankline lives. Um, that's directly across the street, which we have gone there a couple different nights when it's been raining. Um, so, if anything, we hunker down. <laughs> underneath some scaffolding. As far as like online goes, um, the main uh, Occupy Wall Street Twitter account and the main Occupy Wall Street Facebook page um, have picked up on this um, and have been telling people to come down here and um, show support and they've been like sharing our pictures and stuff. I mean, I, ideally I would like to see a few more people maybe be here in person. It would be great. We're at 61st and Broadway. Come out and chat with us for a bit, sleep over one night or something. <laughs> Occupy Goldman Sachs is planning a protest on November 10th, staging it as an angry village mob. Participants are invited to bring fake pitchforks and torches. On Friday, October 22nd, a march and teach-in for Bradley Manning, WikiLeaks, and Julian Assange was held on the steps of the New York Public Library in Midtown Manhattan. Independent journalist Alexa O'Brien, writer Chase Madar, and others spoke to the assembled crowd. Manning is being charged with aiding the enemy, wrongfully causing intelligence to be published on the internet, theft of public records, and transmitting defense information. He could be sentenced to life in prison if convicted. You cannot attribute a single casualty, whether civilian or military, to WikiLeaks. Those journalists who have done their jobs and followed up with the Pentagon have, have been told that there is no credible evidence of anyone being killed because of WikiLeaks. Uh, nor have any foreign civilians who have worked with the State Department been harmed. Instead, we have a much clearer picture of how our foreign per policy is working and how it's not working. What the hell is so wrong with this? Knowing what your government is doing is really not such a bad thing. Making well-informed decisions as a public is really not such a bad thing. I say this not because it's some noble ideal, or some high-minded, glorious thing, but because it's a practical idea. When you don't make well-informed decisions, you wind up with disaster. What WikiLeaks and Bradley Manning have allegedly done is pragmatically shown a bright beam of light where we badly need it. Now, the allergic reaction of the media, the intellectuals, the law schools, the nonprofits, and the government to WikiLeaks is very strange, given that it has long been part of our American political tradition to have a modicum of transparency and openness. This is not an idea that Julian Assange thought up two years ago while sitting on a sofa in Australia. It was JFK who said, after all, that the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. Anyone here remember Woodrow Wilson's 14 points? Well, the very first one of them contains this language. Open covenants of peace, openly arrived at, after which there shall be no private international understandings of any kind, but diplomacy shall proceed always frankly and in the public view. In the public view. And going back to James Madison, a popular government without popular information or the means of acquiring it is but a prologue to a farce or a tragedy or perhaps both. And I think our foreign policy and our statecraft from the, for the past dozen years has been absolutely a tragic farce. You couldn't think of a better definition. And by the way, the James Madison that I just quoted was not Noam Chomsky's teaching assistant in the summer of love. He was the fourth president of the United States and the primary author of the U.S. Constitution. It is Yes We Can and his army of zombies, progressives who have sold their soul, who could care less about drones, 
who could care less about Gitmo, who don't care about extrajudicial assassination, that don't care about NDAA, but like Yes We Can because he looks good coming out of the water. And I will close with the following statement from Mercedes Hafer from Las Vegas. Hello. I could not be with you in New York today. They tell me something about travel restrictions. There's a lot of places I can't go these days and people I can't talk to. A few of you are those people I can't talk to. We are the boogeyman bumping onto the government bed at night. It's true they have money and weapons and prisons and intimidation, but we have time and we have passion and skill and nothing left to lose. We have numbers. Someday we will prevail. Change is inevitable like the rising sun and the tide rushing in. They cannot hold us down forever. We will spring free and their secrets will have their day in the sun. The saying does not go, I am anonymous. The saying of that movement, that movement goes, we are anonymous. We are legion. We will not forget. We will not forgive because we cannot afford to. Thank you. Manning's defense is currently arguing a motion to have his charges dismissed with prejudice due to a lack of a speedy trial. An official protest against secrecy in Manning's trial was lodged recently with the Court of Appeals of the Armed Forces by dozens of media outlets and organizations, including the New York Times, the Associated Press, Dow Jones, CNN, Reuters, the Washington Post, and the New York Daily News. Nevertheless, no major media outlet has a journalist at the ongoing proceedings at Fort Meade in Maryland. On Saturday, October 20th, the activist collective All in the Red led 100 Greenwich Village residents NYU students and faculty in a march to protest the university's plan to expand. The plan is to add six million new square feet to the university in chunks spread out around Manhattan, Brooklyn, and possibly Governor's Island. The call to action was entitled Stop the Purple Monster, and demonstrators used costumed theatrics to call attention to the cause. On the Facebook event page, organizers stated, quote, it is an open secret that the plan, which will cost billions of dollars, will be paid for by student debt and will be a catastrophe of noise, dust, and rats for years to come." End quote. For more information, visit the site of NYU Faculty Against the Sexton Plan, nyufasp.com. In Oregon, Occupy Eugene celebrated their one-year anniversary October 15th. Lauren Steiner, our correspondent in Occupy LA, paid a visit to their free medical clinic and filed this report. We're from Occupy and we have a medical service here that we're offering. We also have dental care. Some weeks our dental hygienist isn't here yet. But, and I do haircuts, beard trim. That's with an asshole too. S-A-E-R-Y-L. My name is Sue Sierra Lupe, and I am the volunteer coordinator for Occupy Medical. We are allied with Occupy Eugene, that's where we started. We first, um, Dr. David and I and some other volunteers, started as just a first aid tent with the camp, and then after the police closed us down, um, uh, we opened October 16th, we closed down December 22nd. Uh, then we kind of sat on it for a little while and we realized that all of our patients still needed that care that we were providing. Initially it was just first aid, then we started seeing more serious patients. People found out we were here and we were free and we began dealing with patients that had grievous conditions that were not being monitored at all. So um, after saving a few lives, and I do mean literally with CPR, um, our heart was really with people that were initially invisible. And once you see something, you can't unsee it, as they say. So we opened up a clinic, which is this clinic, in February. And some of my volunteers and I started um, working on a grant in March. And that was for the um, bus that you see around you. So we're working on another project where we can have lab results. We give vouchers to people for free prescriptions uh, for the first time. 
and we also are working with Riverstone Clinic to get people onto a list so that they can get free, managed, and preventative care. So people come out of here with bottles of vitamins and places to go for uh, uh, free food and shelter and um, more complex services. It is our job to heal, and we have found that um, some of the volunteers that we have here often need as much healing as the patients that they serve. Basically there's a, a war on the poor and we are the mash unit for the war on the poor and the bond that we have serving these people has been instrumental in healing um, the broken um, community that we have been serving and helping the volunteers that come here to help others. That's what we keep seeing over and over again. People are just touched because we need to help other people. That's how you heal. And that's just what we do here. And I love that about this community. I get misty eyed, sorry. I've been coming to the free clinic ever since it opened. It's probably been uh, uh, probably two months. I've dropped in weekly, uh, maybe missing a week or two. Uh, medical wise, the issues I've had to deal with were a broken finger, uh, 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 getting a asthma inhaler, and uh, just a cold, you know, just seeking antibiotics. But whatever issues I've had, they've, they've more than uh, dealt with them and took care of them. And where would you go for these issues if you didn't have this free clinic? I would probably have to sit at home or sit somewhere and have to probably fight it out or if not, you know, succumb to it, you know? If you want to survive on the streets, you need to be invisible. And that means not complaining about your conditions. So people are used to just suffering. They're really, really good at suffering, and that's how they survive. And if we can offer a clinic, deal with just basic wounds, people can get used to the idea that they can ask for help and that they are worthy of help. And that's a big life changer. If you have that idea in your head, you can pick your life up and you can move on. How do you find the attitude of the caregivers here compared to other medical professionals that you've had to deal with in the past? Uh, they know what's going on with us, with, with those that are out here without the uh, uh, health insurance. Uh, they're more, I guess you could say, carefree. Uh, they smile when we come in and they're not stuck up and, 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 and stone-faced when we come and speak to them. Yeah, they're, they're very good people. I, I like them. Uh, well, we serve approximately 20 patients um, for every four-hour shift. Did you need my help? Yeah, so where, where does she go now? Um, she, got a, she got a script in her hand. Where, where, what's the next step? Okay. Uh, she goes to James. Oh, that's okay. good. Out yes. that way or out that way? Um, whichever. Yeah. And what do I do with her chart? With her chart, uh, I, I, James will take that initially okay. and then he'll give it to me. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks. It's one of our volunteers. We have five doctors, volunteer doctors, and I think about 10 volunteer nurses right now. Hello, I'm Bill and I'm a student nurse and helping with the Occupy Medical effort since uh, Washington Jefferson Park. Um, when I heard about it, it was something that I wanted to go uh, help out. I knew that it was essentially addressing kind of economic injustice and uh, uh, I thought the best way to do that was to go help out at the clinic. So I, uh, I went down and started volunteering there and I've been doing that ever since. What kind of reception have you gotten from the city of Eugene? Um, well, one of the most wonderful compliments that we got from them um, is that they uh, kind of claimed that um, one of the great things they are doing for the homeless is providing free health care. If they feel so proud about what we're doing that they're willing to take credit for it, Oh, hallelujah! That means that they recognize that it is vital, needed, and needs to expand. Because we are here, um, we've only had two crime incidents in this area. So every Sunday, there's only been, since February, two crime incidents. So that is a huge dip in crime. And I know for the rest of us, it's fairly obvious. You take care of people, they're not in pain, they can make better choices. Duh, right? <laughs>
How do you go and recruit your doctors, nurses, and EMTs? We just show up here and people show up. I mean, they hear about us. Other other doctors tell other doctors. You know, it's it, we haven't really actively gone out to, to seek other help, but we've had, you know, nurses don't have health insurance. <laughs> So if you're working two part-time jobs and you're working with the population that we're, we're working with, you really need to have health care. They don't have it. So that's one of the things that we're doing is we're offering a positive example so that voters will not be afraid to vote for single-payer health care. Health care is for all. It is a basic human right. And if people see what it looks like, we're not walking around with Mao jackets or trying to oppress anyone. It just, you need care, you get care. The end. That's all there is to it. And that's what this country should represent. I'm starting with Oregon. Watch out, world. <laughs> so that's our show for today. Hope you enjoyed it. Let us know what you think. Give us a call at the number on your screen or send us an email. See you next week.